In August of 1971, Professor Philip Zambardo began an investigation into the power dynamics that exist between guards and inmates in a prison setting. The object of the Stanford Prison Experiment was to determine if it was the acquisition of power that made guards turn brutal, or whether brutality was actually intrinsic to human nature itself. The notorious experiment that ensued would kick off decades of academic controversy and suggest some very dark things about the nature of humanity. Today, we're going to take a look at why the Stanford Prison Experiment might be the most disturbing study ever conducted. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel and let us know in the comments below what other psychology-related topics you would like to hear about. During the 1970s, both the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps were interested in learning about the hierarchies of power in military prisons. Accordingly, the U.S. Office of Naval Research issued Philip Zimbardo a grant to study the relationships between prison guards and prisoners. The objective would be to determine if those relationships were shaped more by the prison environment or the personalities of the guards. The grant would be used to create a mock prison environment in which to conduct the experiment and to pay the participants. The Stanford Prison Experiment started with an ad Zimbardo placed in the classifieds. It read, Male college students needed for psychological study of prison life, $15 per day for one to two weeks. 70 people applied. The applicants were interviewed and asked to take personality tests. Anyone who had a criminal record or record of abusing narcotics was eliminated, as was anyone who displayed personality disorders, physical disabilities, or psychological problems. Ultimately, 24 college students, all white and all male, were selected to participate. They had no idea what they were getting themselves into. Zimbardo and his team randomly divided the students into two groups, prisoners and guards. There were 12 of each category, nine that were active participants, and three that were alternates. On August 17, 1971, the experiment began when the nine prisoners were arrested by actual police officers from the Palo Alto Police Department. Each person was taken into custody, then had their mugshots taken before being fingerprinted, blindfolded, and moved into a holding cell. Finally, they were taken into a mock prison that had been set up in the basement of Stanford's Jordan Hall. The fake prison felt very real. The researchers who created it had consulted with prison officials and ex-convicts before designing it. The cells were built in a space that was normally used as a laboratory. Each cell had a barred door, a cell number, and room for three prisoners. Other touches included a solitary confinement cell that had been created in a closet, and a rule that prisoners had to be blindfolded before being taken to the bathroom. To avoid selection bias, participants were assigned to be either prisoners or guards based on the results of a coin toss. Very different fates awaited each respective group. Guards were given real prison guard uniforms, complete with nightsticks and whistles. Many guards even donned mirrored sunglasses, which were meant to prevent eye contact with the prisoners. Or maybe just to look like Boss Godfrey from Cool Hand Luke. Prisoners, on the other hand, were stripped, deloused, and dressed in sandals and an ill-fitting numbered smock. They weren't issued any underwear, but they were given nylon stocking caps, which they were asked to wear in lieu of having their heads shaved. Once dressed, a chain was placed on each of their legs. Prisoners were only addressed by their number and had to refer to themselves and the other prisoners in the same way. It was a recipe for dehumanization and oppression. Zimbardo himself served as superintendent of the prison, and researcher David Jaffe played the warden. The two were responsible for instructing the guards and laying down the scope of their duties. First and foremost, the guards were told to maintain order. To this end, they were allowed to use any means necessary, short of physical violence. Things that were permitted included harassment, the withholding of food, and the deprivation of privileges at the guards' discretion. The guards, unlike the prisoners, were also allowed to work in shifts. The shifts, which each required three guards, lasted eight hours. Off-duty guards didn't have to be at the prison, but were asked to remain on call in case of an emergency. On the first night, the guards decided to use a whistle to rouse the prisoners from their sleep for a headcount at 2.30 a.m. Some of the prisoners didn't take the headcount seriously, and the guards punished them by making them do push-ups. After a headcount, the prisoners had already had enough and decided to rebel. On what was only the second morning of the experiment, they removed the numbers from their uniforms, pulled off their stocking caps, and barricaded themselves inside their cells using their beds. When the next shift of guards arrived in the morning, they were alarmed to find the prisoners yelling curses at them from their cells. 
They requested reinforcements and made plans to quell the uprising. They brought in the on-call guards and the night shift volunteered to do extra duty. It was only day two and things were already getting ugly. In order to get the cell doors open, the guards used fire extinguishers to force the prisoners away from the barricades. Once that was accomplished, they rushed into the cell, grabbed the prisoner, and stripped them naked. Naked as a jaybird. The birthday suit prisoner was then placed into solitary confinement. While they were there, the guards would remove the bed from their cell, meaning the prisoner would have to sleep on the floor when they returned. Once the rebellion was controlled, the guards had to figure out how to prevent another from happening without having to have all nine guards perpetually on duty. The solution was to divide and conquer. The guards deemed one of the cells the privilege cell. Well-behaved prisoners were placed in the privilege cell, where they would get their uniforms and beds back and even get special meals. The other prisoners were not only denied of all these things, but were deprived of their normal food rations. After a few hours, the guards would randomly move the prisoners around. The idea was to create confusion and sow the seeds of distrust among the inmates. And it worked. In the wake of the uprising, conditions deteriorated fast. The guards started making a point of dehumanizing the prisoners by making them call out their identification numbers. Prisoners were also forbidden from using the bathroom at night and were forced to use a bucket in their cell instead. Soon the guards stopped emptying the buckets, reasoning that the bad smell was simply another punishment for misbehavior. Despite what Zimbardo described as frequent reminders from the staff, the guards grew increasingly aggressive. The most egregious behavior occurred when the staff wasn't paying attention, which became stressful and frustrating for the prisoners. The prisoners, as a result, became increasingly submissive, and the experiment was about to claim its first victim. After only 36 hours, prisoner Doug Corpy began suffering from what was described as acute emotional disturbance, disorganized thinking, uncontrollable crying, and rage. The guards used this opportunity to try and coax him into becoming a snitch. But when his erratic behavior continued, the staff realized Doug was in genuine distress and needed to be released from the experiment. On the sixth day, Zimbardo convened a mock parole board, which was headed by one of the experiment's prison consultants. Inmates who believed they deserved parole would be allowed to present their case to the board. It was during these presentations that Zimbardo, along with the other researchers, began to theorize that the prisoners no longer saw themselves as participants in an experiment, but as real prisoners. According to Zimbardo, the prisoners had internalized their crimes, as well as their roles as inmates. As for the guards, he came to identify three different types. Tough but fair guards, who followed prison rules. Good guys, who did little favors for the prisoners and never punished them. And finally, guards who appeared to thoroughly enjoy the power they wielded. Zimbardo felt this last group was hostile, arbitrary, and inventive in their forms of prisoner humiliation. Zimbardo concluded that most people were ultimately willing to fulfill whatever role they were given in a respective social setting. He even admitted that he had internalized his role as superintendent over his role as a psychologist. At one point, Zimbardo brought in a real priest to talk with the prisoners. It was during this conversation that prisoner 819 broke down sobbing. He was so hysterical that the staff agreed to take him to a doctor. The other inmates, for their part, turned on 819. Researchers offered to send him home, but 819 surprisingly refused, saying that he couldn't leave because the other inmates had labeled him a bad prisoner. Zimbardo was forced to intervene. Pulling the student aside, he forcefully reminded him that he was not really an inmate and that the experiment was not really a prison. The prisoner is alleged to have stopped crying and looked at Zimbardo like a small child awakened from a nightmare. After that, 819 agreed to leave. On the sixth day, a recent PhD recipient named Christina Maslach was brought in to interview the prisoners. Horrified by what she saw, she confronted Zimbardo, asking him how he could see what she had seen and not care about the students who were suffering. According to Zimbardo, he quickly realized she was right. It was at that moment that he decided to prematurely end the study. Later, he would reflect on his own behavior and claim that it wasn't until his discussion with Maslach that he realized how deeply he had internalized his role at the prison. Ultimately, he concluded he was thinking like a prison superintendent rather than a research psychologist. Both the ethics and conclusions of the Stanford prison experiment remain highly controversial. 
Its scientific rigor has been repeatedly questioned by scientists who have been unable to duplicate its results. And even Zimbardo himself has admitted the whole thing was more of a demonstration than a scientific experiment. A 2018 book by French academic Thibault Le Texier dismissed the entire thing as nonsense. He argued that the guards had been told what results they were supposed to produce and were advised and guided by Zimbardo and his staff the whole way through. So what do you think? How would you have fared in the study? Let us know in the comments below. And while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from Our Weird History.